Okay, so um, I'm in uh, the Hudson Valley in New York, and uh, I'm speaking with Jairam Ramesh, uh, who is in India. He has written a, a very valuable new book called Green Signals. I've been meaning to talk to him for a while about it. Uh, the issues are more relevant than ever as we sort of make the um, journey through Paris. I don't say to Paris because anyone who thinks Paris is the end of the road is fantasizing, knowing how climate negotiations work. So, Jairam, uh, if you could um, sort of lay out your, your main argument, especially in that last section about uh, coal, India, and climate. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, inflated expectations about what India can do um, on emissions, perhaps because yeah. the agreement was between the U.S. and China recently. Can you lay out, in a very basic way, India's challenge, uh, both on energy and and um, emissions? Well, uh, Andrew, India now contributes about 6% of global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, much, much less than the 29% of China and the 15% of uh, the US and 11% of the EU. So quantitatively, as of now, uh, India is not a major contributor. However, uh, if it continues to grow at 75 to 8% per year, as it has over the last decade, uh, by the year 2030, uh, the projections are that India would become the second largest emitter, uh, next only to China. And by 2030, India's emissions would be equal uh, to the level of emissions of the U.S. right now. So clearly, uh, the concern uh, in 2015 is China. Uh, the concern in the period 2015 to 2030 uh, would certainly include India. Uh, now, the, the conundrum which India faces uh, is clearly relating to coal uh, because uh, a close to 65% of the electricity generated in India comes from coal uh, and even with the most aggressive of assumptions on nuclear, on hydro, on solar, on wind, uh, it appears that by the year 2030 about 55 percent of India's electricity would come from coal, which would mean that coal consumption in India uh, would increase two to three times over the next 15 years uh, as compared to 2015 level. Now, that's the conundrum that India faces. More coal, I uh, mean, uh, the coal reserves are in the forest areas, as my book describes, uh, and the more coal you extract, the more deforestation you will have, that will add to global warming in itself. And the more coal you use, the more CO2 you will put out. And therefore, you, we are in a double whammy. Mm. Can uh, you uh, therefore, you know, from a growth point of view, it's a very cruel conundrum because India uh, consuming about 700 million tons of coal right now, about uh, six times, uh, about five to one fifth that of China's level. Now, China has agreed, China has committed to peak its coal consumption by the year 2020. And they're talking of peaking by about, at about 3.8 to 4 billion tons. Whereas India's coal consumption is projected to increase to about 2 to 2.5 billion tons by the year 2030. Now, all this, of course, Andrew assumes uh, uh, that all our uh, assumptions on nuclear, on solar, uh, on wind, on hydro fructify. For example, today, India's solar capacity is 3 gigawatts. Uh, and the projection and the government's target is to reach 100 gigawatts by the year 2022, which is seven years from now, which is a hugely formidable target. Uh, the wind capacity is about 22 gigawatts, uh, 
uh, and is expected to reach 60 gigawatts uh, by the year 2022, which is more doable. The solar one looks very, very formidable. Yeah. Nuclear, uh, nuclear right now is uh, uh, around, uh, it's about 3.5% of total electricity consumption. Uh, and uh, with all the capacity that is on the ground, by the end of 2016, we will have 10 gigawatts of nuclear capacity, which uh, has to grow to about 30 gigawatts in 2030. So um, I'm just laying it out for you. Uh, yeah. These are the numbers, you know, right. uh, and not a pretty picture. Uh, it's a picture uh, which is very uh, uh, depressing in a way uh, from an environmental point of view because uh, coal has so many adverse environmental impacts. However, it seems that there is really no alternative uh, to coal, uh, evidently cleaner coal, not clean coal, which is uh, on cleaner coal, uh, which India will have to commit to. Uh, you know, as part of its uh, clean energy commitment. Yeah. Um, can you add one more metric? Just so uh, I, it's one that I use a lot, which gets also the the, um, uh, the the moral challenge um, um, the world grapples with. And the latest numbers I saw for India's per capita annual emissions of CO two were one point nine tons. No, we are only about two tons, Andrew. Right. Uh, we we and, are and per capita. We are at two tons, and uh, even by 2030, uh, we, our per capita emissions uh, is not going to cross four tons per capita. Right. China is and, already. China is already, uh, uh, you know, at about ten tons per capita, uh, and uh, the Chinese are going to peak by 2026. Or 2030 at about 10 tons, eight to 10 tons per capita. Yeah. Now, so per capita. See, I, I'm not one of those Indians who uses the per capita argument very, very uh, extensively because anything per capita in India is bound to be low. Yeah. The denomination is 1.25 billion, uh, increasing by 12 million every year. You know, so uh, it's a no-brainer. So the per capita is a uh, is is there, uh, and uh, our former prime minister, when I was the minister for environment, uh, we had committed that at all times our per capita emissions will be lower than the per capita emissions of the developed world. Mm -hmm. so if the developed world were to come down to six tons per capita, uh, we would not. We we were, we committed. So there is an implicit peaking year which we have accepted. Uh, 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 that you know, but however, I must hasten to add that uh, our per capita income is is considerably lower. Yeah. So while our per capita emissions might converge, our per capita incomes will not converge. You know, uh, we, would, we would be at four tons per capita uh, in twenty thirty at a per capita income of perhaps eight thousand know? dollars. Right. Uh, yeah, so I think that's an important uh, metric that we need to keep in mind, both the per capita emissions, but also the per capita income. Now, one of the things that I have advocated um, as part of the book and subsequently is that India should now start thinking of a peaking a plateau, not of a peaking year. Uh, the Chinese uh, have given a peaking year as part of the bilateral accord with the Americans. They have suggested that they would peak, uh, you know, around about 2030, if not earlier. Right. Uh, but the peak assumes an inverted V. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that in the run-up to Paris, India start thinking of an inverted U, not an inverted V. Uh, and, you know, put out some numbers out there that by 2030, we would plateau our coal consumption. Uh, and depending on how quickly we are able to make the transition to new coal, new technologies, 
uh, the the shape of that inverted U could either be elongated or it could be compressed. So right. uh, don't talk about a peaking year because that has very grave implications as of now for India's energy strategy. But certainly to give international confidence, uh, talk about a peaking plateau. Yeah. Can you do me a favor and tip your camera down slightly? Here, or just back away from the computer a tiny bit? That's great. You're just a, it just needs to be a, a little, that's, that's perfect. Um, so uh, what's the, so conundrums require, uh, if not a solution, require kind of a best case uh, attempt. So what's your best case attempt for, uh, I mean, let me just, let me add one question, uh, which is about, I've been very skeptical about carbon capture and storage at scale, at large scale. Uh, every time I hear someone um, in the U.S. or elsewhere try to square the numbers, they immediately jump to carbon capture as if it's uh, some kind of thing tool you can take off the shelf right now. Do you have your own sense of that? No, I, I am not putting my money on CCS at all. You know, uh, I would. Uh, I think that in the in the arena of coal technology. Uh, I would certainly uh, make a huge investment in supercritical power generation, which India is doing. Uh, that would give us about a 5% saving in emissions. Uh, we should be very heavily talking about coal gasification. You know, Duke Energy has a big plant in Indiana, uh, you know, along the lines that I'm talking about, which is integrated gasific combined cycle uh, coal gasification. That's what, you know, we should be looking at very seriously in terms of coal. Uh, so uh, I think it's, uh, I, I, I think that, um, you know, we cannot afford to abandon the coal option. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult for me to swallow what I'm saying. Uh, you know, I'm considered to be, a, you know, sort of an eco-freak uh, <laughs> by the group of fanatics in India. But even I have to say, Andrew, that uh, uh, given India's growth uh, challenge, uh, I can't see India uh, practicing, um, you know, uh, practicing uh, a policy that would uh, abandon a commitment to coal. But certainly, clean, cleaner coal, coal gasification, uh, uh, as I said, supercritical technology, and of course, a huge, huge impetus uh, on solar, uh, on wind, uh, on uh, demand management, on energy efficiency. You know, all that goes without saying. Right. And there are, uh, realistically, there are certainly big chunks of India where um, traditional grid, uh, centralized power plants and grid won't be the, the uh, no. electricity choice for, for million, hundreds of millions of people. I, I think least, uh, a couple hundred million people. One of the things that we ought to be doing, which we are not doing right now uh, as part of our solar strategy, is really to look at the German model, you know. Uh, the German model is far more important for India because in India we have still out of 200 and about 200 million homes, about 50 million homes who do not have electricity. So it's not just the gigawatts that matter, uh, it's the household electrification that matters. Right. We have to reach people and for that uh, you need smart grids, uh, you need decentralized uh, energy production, decentralized energy distribution and that's why you know, I'm uh, I'm quite fascinated by uh, the German model, uh, which not only has generated 37 gigawatts of solar capacity in a country which has no comparative advantage in solar at all, uh, right. but also has created uh, five million uh, producers of electricity. You know, uh, who are producing electricity in a decentralized manner and distributing it. And so I think uh, that's what we really need to focus on as part of our, it's not just utility model uh, solar that we should be looking at. Unfortunately, you know, we are still mesmerized by the gigawatt number for solar, right. uh, but we should be really looking at what you said, uh, which is uh, smaller grids, decentralized grids, uh, smarter grids, and so on. Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Harish Hande, Harish Hande from South yes, Harish is a good example. We have Ashok Khosla, you know, who has, uh, with the help of Rockefeller Foundation, uh, they have a project called the Speed Project, uh, which is actually bringing uh, solar energy into homes. It's not adding gigawatts, but it's certainly ensuring uh, solar solutions uh, to house electrification. Yeah. So Harish is a 
example. Selco is a good example. Development alternatives of Ashok Khosla is a good example. And this, uh, these experiments really need to be scaled up on a much larger scale. Uh, and uh, that's you know going to mean uh, some uh, some relief uh, on the coal front. You know. Yeah. Um, what's the role here of uh, you know one thing when I when I run these numbers. And even a best case scenario, I'll just show you, I'll run you through a little math lesson I did for myself a few years ago, where I say, suppose the whole world came in by 2050 at six tons per person per year, which would be kind of a great achievement. You know, like, it would imply that the, the rich, the, the United States coming down from 17 to six, that's pretty big. Uh, India coming up to six is sort of an indica indication, a soft indication of, of energy that the population's been energized. But it's still nine billion people times six. That still leads to 54 billion tons of CO2 a year. And, and what that leads me back to is 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 the role of innovation. Uh, in other words, the next generation of of solar or whatever storage uh, which comes with solar. What are we not, and I've written about the, the big gap in what we are spending on basic science. I don't know if that matters or yeah. you or not. Let me add a footnote to what you say, Andrew. I mean, your numbers are absolutely on the mark. Uh, let me add a footnote. Uh, you know, if, if, if the world converges at six tons per capita, the U.S. would be at six tons with a per capita income of $45,000. India would be uh, per capita six at less than $10,000, okay? So, uh, yeah. per capita emissions may have converged, but per capita incomes have not converged. Right. Uh, so that, that's a footnote to what you what you know what uh, just to what you're saying. But you're absolutely right. But you know the prospect of the U.S. Uh, taking on the responsibility for reducing per capita from 17 tons to six tons is simply not on the cards. You know. I, know. I mean, I, I don't know. see it happening. I know. So I, I mean, I to me, it's just, a, with a thought experiment. I mean, it's just yeah. a thought experiment. I mean, I see, I see Europeans stabilizing uh, at about. You know, between six to eight tons per capita. You know, right. uh, I think the Europeans would do that. Uh, I don't see the Russians doing. Uh, I don't see the Australians uh, certainly doing at six tons. Uh, I don't see Singapore stabilizing at six tons. I can see India stabilizing at about four to four and a half tons per capita. But uh, the U.S. is the big elephant in the room. <laughs> the biggest elephant in the room. It's the Brontosaurus in the room. <laughs> So uh, this implies a, a, a lot of uh, climate adaptation, among other things. In other yeah. words, we're, we're facing a, a lot of uh, buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere going forward. And uh, yeah. whatever uh, curves, wish, wishful curves one might want to draw on paper, the reality is um, we haven't moved off of the fossil era in, in a meaningful way, uh, or at least the emissions era. And um, so, I, I mean, to me, that says we have to get a lot busier on uh, basic science per unit of GDP. You know, it's still very low. Uh, OECD countries spending on basic research and energy, um, yes. energy-related sciences, is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what they spend on uh, science and other arenas that matter, including defense. Defense uh, research, basic science for defense, is, is much, much bigger number. And, and so to me that's a proxy for essentially we're still not really engaged with the reality of, of if we really want to kind of cut emissions, you either have to turn off the global economy or you have to come up with something fundamentally cheaper than coal uh, or, or, or something. I, I don't know, you, you know, this is the, the grand global conundrum, uh, you, you, you articulated idiot's conundrum, uh, and I don't know, you know a way around that. I uh, well, you know, I think um, um, I, I, you know you, you you started this conversation by talking about Paris, and let me sort of you know come back to the Paris end of this conversation. Uh, you know, it's very clear in Paris that we are you know we are now in a bottom-up uh, commitment regime. You know, you have the INDCs, you know, the the intended nationally determined contributions, a particularly ugly phrase. You know, it should be called commitments, not intended nationally determined contributions. However, uh, but those are going to be bottom up. Those are going to be nationally determined. So uh, what we're going to get in Paris, uh, what we should get in Paris, is hybrid architecture. 
uh, which has a bottom-up commitment uh, regime uh, embodied in the INDC, but a top-down MRV regime, the monitoring, reporting, and verification of the type that was agreed to at Copenhagen and Cancun. You know, my frustration is that we have lost five years in this shadow boxing. Uh, and what was agreed to at Copenhagen and subsequently that was endorsed in Cancun, uh, we are coming back to it in a way in 2015 in Paris. Now, if the uh, if the IN, if the bottom-up commitment architecture is not supported by a top-down MRV architecture, then it's it's a recipe for disaster. The very least Paris must ensure uh, is that there is a top-down MRV architecture, which all countries adhere to, uh, uh, along with, of course, the bottom-up INDCs. And as you said, Paris is not a destination. It's a springboard. So we come back to Paris you know, in three years or five years, review the INDCs, uh, and then take on a progressively higher level of commitment yeah. you know, uh, as we gain experience. So uh, I think this is where uh, we must be realistic in our expectations of Paris. We should not, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned that the, the media, you know, the Guardian, for example, is, has started this evangelical movement on climate change. Uh, and I, you know, I'm always suspicious of evangelists of all, all varieties, you know, and yeah. uh, uh, that's why even on, as far as Al Gore is concerned, I've been very, very cautious about uh, Mr. Gore and you know, the, the, the things that he does. So evangelism is not going to lead us anywhere, I'm afraid. One has to be realistic. Uh, and what you're going to get in Paris uh, is an agreement that is politically acceptable, uh, a, a, an agreement that is economically uh, desirable, but an agreement that is environmentally suboptimal. Uh, but that's not, you know, that I think we should move on from there uh, and lay out a low-carbon pathway uh, for each country in Paris. So in Paris, uh, I, I hope that, you know, what we get out of Paris is a, a top-down MRV architecture. And second, we get from the major emitters, the US, China, the Europeans, the Russians, the Indians, uh, we, the South Africans, we get from them a low-carbon pathway for the year 2020 to 2050 with intervening milestones in order to build the international confidence that you know, we are headed uh, in the direction of decarbonization. Um, one quick question from your standpoint. I mean, you've worked a lot with the, I remember the whole architecture of the Group of 77. And, and basically, um, the other issue on the table at Paris that historically in earlier iterations has blown things up is the money, the uh, adaptation of uh, Money um, that yes. that's always sort of looming in the background, like a little ticking bomb, uh, and and the developed countries seem to kind of keep kicking that can down the road, as we say in the states. I'm not sure, but uh, do you think that's going to blow up in Paris again? It, it, it is. Money, you know, this, climate, you know? this climate finance. This is Hillary Clinton's contribution to Copenhagen. You know, she was the one who gave this hundred billion dollars a year figure at Copenhagen. I was very skeptical about that hundred billion dollars a year, uh, but however, that has got now uh, it's here, uh, and it was hundred billion dollars a year by the year 2020. Uh, we are nowhere near that, uh, and you know, particularly the AOCs countries, the small island states, Africa, the Caribbean countries, the Pacific island states uh, are all saying, "Hey, wait a minute, where's the money?" Where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the adaptation money? Where's the green climate fund? Uh, you know, with great difficulty, we're talking about $10 billion, you know, commitments. Uh, so I'm afraid uh, and climate finance could in fact end up derailing, uh, you know, the, the Paris. And don't put it past the Chinese and the Indians uh, to board their friends in 1977 to keep talking about climate finance in order to ensure that mitigation does not get the attention it deserves. Yeah, hold on one second. I have to close the window. I'm realizing there's the construction outside is a, might be a problem. Hold on one second.
Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, um, so what I was saying was, yes, the point that you have raised on climate finance uh, is very important. Uh, it, and the Africans, the Caribbean countries, the Pacific Island states, the small island states are all asking, okay, guys, you know, where's the money? You know, where's the money for our adaptation? And what is the what's the governance mechanism uh, that is going to ensure that money gets distributed, dis dispersed uh, easily, you know, uh, and and quickly? So uh, yes, it's uh, it's a major issue, and the lack of major financial commitment uh, uh, you know with difficulty we you know we are probably touching 10 billion dollars a year but whether that 10 billion is new and additional or whether that 10 billion represents redefinition of existing aid money right. uh, that itself is a big question mark you know right well it's kind of a parallel to what you were saying about mrv uh, measuring reporting and verifying there's, there's going to be the same demand on the financing yeah, the yeah. yeah it's a tough one um and one, one last thing I, I well actually you know what i'd like you to do i may be i'm going to edit this a little bit so um one, uh, if you could i want to do a step back a little bit and just have you introduce the uh, the basic ideas in your book um and, and that'll come at the beginning so just so you know i'm going to Andrew, your voice is cracking. Okay, um, hold on. No, I was saying if you could um, um, do right now, just do a basic introduction to the uh, the themes in your book, and I'm gonna yeah. edit, I'm gonna edit the video <clears throat> uh, and back up a little bit again from the computer so I can see your face. And just so okay. say, you know, I've written this book because, yeah. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Andrew, this book uh, has a subtitle, although it's called Green Signals. The sub-theme is Ecology, Growth, and Democracy in India. And what it, what it does is it highlights the trade-offs that have to be made, the choices that have to be made, the conflicts that have to be confronted, the contradictions that exist when we look at this triangle of ecology, growth, and democracy. Our political system is a democratic system. Our economic objective is faster growth as represented by GDP numbers, uh, both domestic and international, not just climate change, but good old pollution issues, livelihood issues, public health issues, you know. So why should India take ecology seriously. Uh, and the basic theme of the book is uh, growth counts, but environment matters. Uh, and I've tried to explain why does environment matter for you? Because of demographic reasons, it matters because of climate change reasons, it matters because of public health reasons, and it matters because of uh, livelihood reasons. So it really is a journey, you know, uh, it represents the 26 months that I was Minister for Environment and Forests, the choices I had to face, the conflicts I had to resolve, the contradictions I had to uh, somehow um, resolve, uh, both domestically and internationally. And I think it's, you know, sort of a, it's a fun read, that's all I can say, you know. The fact <laughs> told, it's a fun read. <clears throat> well, and one, one of the conundrums for me, looking at environmental history around the world is uh, one of the questions is whether today's developing countries uh, have to replicate the full pattern of uh, yeah. this dynamic that happened here. I live in the Hudson Valley. The Hudson River 50 years ago was an open sewer. There were you, I wrote a piece in the 90s about if you walked along the banks of the river, you knew what was being manufactured there because you could see the, the glue in one place, the paint in another place. And, 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 and so you think now, well, is is this just a process we all have to go through? This dyna the dynamic between economic prosperity and, and environmental care, uh, and I think India is demonstrating that there are some possibilities to, to lead. Actually, uh, Andrew, the last chapter in my book uh, uh, highlights why India should not follow the American or the Chinese "grow now, pay later" model. You know why we must be different, uh, and we can be different. Uh, I think you raised a very fundamental issue, you know, that one of the advantages of being a latecomer is you don't have to replicate past patterns. 
Uh, and uh, the strong message from the book is that uh, you cannot uh, deforest your way to prosperity. You cannot pollute your way to prosperity and you cannot contaminate your way to prosperity. And today you have those choices that you can make. Uh, and so and, and so, how do you make those choices? Right. Uh, what are the political process that the choices are made? I mean, that's the basic theme of the book. Right. And then, but of course, then it transitions into the climate. Uh, the climate the question is so particular. So for example, another issue we haven't talked about but is very, very uh, politically very important and uh, otherwise, from a food security point of view, is what do you do on genetic engineering? You know, there's a whole chapter in my book on uh, genetically modified aubergine, uh, which is, you know, the first food crop that was sought to be introduced and how India uh, tried to follow a different policy from the American policy, which is a permissive policy and the European policy, which is a prohibitive policy. So we worked out a precautionary policy, you know, on, on genetically modified food crops. So, I mean, that's an example. Climate change is another issue. There are pollution issues. There are forestry issues. Uh, so I, I think all in all, what the book represents is, I mean, it's not theory, it's practice. You know, how as a minister, uh, I had to grapple with these issues of ecology in an economic environment which stressed growth and in a political environment which is anchored in democracy. Yeah, uh, you know, and, uh, getting back, actually, I, I forgot to ask you about the uh, the GMO question because it's so overheated. It's so hard, it seems, for us um, in many uh, uh, societies to have a, have a discussion that is um, science-informed, precautionary, but not completely argued from the edges. The edges are ban it or go, go, go. And, and maybe could you talk a little bit about the eggplant, the, the aubergine? Just you know, how well, you know the egg, eggplant. The eggplant is a particularly interesting example. It's a stupid little vegetable, right? You know, but it's uh, India is a center of genetic diversity uh, for brinjal, as it is called here, not aubergine, uh, and uh, it's used for medicine. It's used, you know, in a variety of. There are three thousand different varieties of brinjal that's available here. Uh, and uh, of course, the whole debate got also uh, vitiated by the fact that Monsanto was involved, and anything that involves Monsanto, you know, uh, you know, across the political spectrum, the loss of genetic diversity, you know, all these issues. So, you know, what I did was uh, I put a moratorium on the commercialization of BT brinjal. Uh, not uh, banning genetic engineering or uh, crops per se. Uh, you know, for example, today 98% of our cotton is BT cotton. But brinjal aubergine was different because it was going to be the food crop. There were issues of safety, toxicity, long term effects. Uh, uh, you know, so, I, you know, it's uh, there was a lot of issues, and, you know, I've discussed that at length in the book. And uh, it's interesting that. Uh, the moratorium was imposed in February 2009, uh, so it's almost coming now, uh, 2010, sorry, it's over five years and the government has changed, but the moratorium has remained, you know, uh, because the conditions that I had laid down for lifting the moratorium uh, have really not been fulfilled in any significant measure. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you think there's, uh, that people are over-concerned about the Monsanto issue is always there. I think a lot of times people's oppositions to these technologies are more about opposition to corporate behavior. Um, do yeah. you yourself, do you yourself have a perception of agriculture? You know, so they're worried about the they're worried about the corporatization of agriculture. Right, right. The seed seed availability. You know, traditionally farmers have saved seed uh, now you know you're going to replace that by a dependence on seed companies uh, traditionally the seed industry in india has been a public sector dominated industry now you're having private companies so there are a whole set of questions relating to seed uh, genetic diversity safety toxicity uh, so i think so what i did was follow the middle path not permissive not prohibitive 
but precautionary. Let's go slowly. Let's understand the full implications of what we are attempting. And so that's one of the chap one of the big issues in the book, actually. Okay. I, I just one thing I, I I can't remember in the book. Do you, do you weigh in per personally on your perception of the uh, the health uh, and or so the biological risk questions, which seem yes. when you look at the science, yes. don't seem to have much merit. I found, I found, uh, you know, I wrote to 50 different scientists all over the world, and that's there in the book. And I got, including in the U.S., and I got very eminent scientists giving me a view, saying, "Go ahead with BT Brinjal." I got equally eminent scientists telling me, "Go slow on BT Brinjal," you know, because of the risk element, because of the health element, and so on and so forth. So, I, I didn't find a great scientific consensus either. Forget the politics of it. Forget the political consensus. In fact, the entire political establishment in India was hostile uh, to genetically modified crops, uh, particularly because it was seen to be multinational driven, Monsanto driven, you know, uh, and that I think was part of the problem uh, when it came to genetically modified crops. But uh, even in the science, Andrew, uh, I found the scientific community uh, divided. Uh, uh, on on uh, the economic benefits uh, of, for example, uh, even the best studies on BT cotton uh, reveal that only about 20% of the yield increase that has taken place over the last decade in India is attributable to BT technology. So it's not as if, you know, India entire revolution in cotton is because of BT. Only 20% of the yield increase is actually attributable to the BT technology, which is a genetic modification. Right, right, right. So, uh, what's your final word? Uh, if if you could uh, uh, be in an elevator with uh, President Obama and his counterpart in uh, <laughs> China, and and perhaps the head of the EU, and and have the completely unbridled uh, possibility to influence them <laughs> in a realistic way on on how to get through Paris and on a track that's realistic but, but well, uh, ambitious. The, the breakthrough will come uh, fr uh, politically. It's not going to come through the negotiators. Mm -hmm. The negotiators negotiate to keep their jobs. You know, they want to continue negotiating and see all the exotic places in the world. <laughs> the, breakthrough, the breakthrough will come from the politicians. The breakthrough in 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 uh, Copenhagen came because of President Obama's uh, meeting with the quartet of President Lula, Prime Minister Singh, Premier Wen Jiabao, and President Zuma. It was the polit the politicians, the political leaders who did the breakthrough. So it's Obama, it's Chancellor Merkel, uh, it's um, Hollande, Mr. Narendra Modi, uh, President Xi Jinping. Uh, President Zuma, uh, President Dilma, these are the people who are going to give the breakthrough, not the negotiators. It's the, politi the, the politics, the, the eight or nine top political leaders uh, who are uh, heading the top emitters. I mean, I think President Obama should call a summit uh, of the 10 top emitters uh, uh, and call them to Camp David uh, and discuss this. Uh, and say, look, guys, the negotiators can do what they want, but we are the guys who have to give the direction. Yeah. You know, uh, and I think uh, he should call Modi, he should call uh, uh, Olan, he should call Merkel, he should call Putin. I mean, that's difficult whether Putin will come or not. Uh, he should call Xi Jinping. Uh, he should call Cameron. I mean, Cameron doesn't count much, but nevertheless, uh, uh, and you know, and um, you know, he should call some of these. The biggest emitters, you know. Yeah, and, oh, and, and that does take us back into it. That was something that uh, the Bush administration uh, also tried in the lead uh, the major emitters uh, track. Um, um, I, I mean, one of one of my you know I've been writing about this since um, well 1988 in a big way, and so since before the treaty process began. And and um, I think one thing I've come to my own realization on is. That is essentially one of the big transitions here is away from the idea of a grand solution for the normalization of continued work. In other words, climate change is more like poverty alleviation than it's it is like, than it is like uh, fighting a fire. Is yeah, that is true. that a, is that a true is that true? This you know this grand 
grand overarching agreement uh, which we have been chasing for a long time a totally unrealistic a top down agreement particularly totally unrealistic and i think uh, the way to go is a series of steps a series of credible steps incremental uh, but uh, uh, steps which countries take accountability for domestically and internationally uh, and uh, there's no magic bullet you, know, you just keep keep at it you just keep at it and but i i want to stress the politics of it andrew uh, more than anything else i think you know it's it's the political leaders and i think president obama's greatest legacy would be the camp david summit on uh, on climate change and you should just get these leaders for two days and say the, this is what we need to get out of paris you know Okay, well, I'll pass that along to his people. Thanks, Andrew. I really appreciate your time. And, and Have thank a good you day. Have a good day. Great to talk Thanks. to you always. Thanks. Bye-bye.